Okay, so that's me now? Yeah, go ahead. All right, let's go. I'm going to do that really annoying uh, Zoom meeting thing that everybody does and say, can you see my screen? We can see your screen. If you see a cute dog, then we're in a good place. Okay, <laughs> so I, I have to uh, admit to a mistake that I made here because after setting this up with Lenka and Dana, um, I looked at the title of my own talk and didn't get the joke. So it's content to content Google rather than content to content Google, which doesn't make sense. So I'm a dad and I make bad dad jokes and they're so bad that even I forget what, how bad they are. So it's content to content Google. That's the point. So that's what we're talking about today. And here's a lovely content dog that we're going to go through. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to spend too long on this whole introduction thing because Tana did a much better job of this than I did. Um, the bits I'm going to point out are that I spend way too much time on Twitter. So if you think of questions afterwards and you know, I'm not online anymore, then bang me on Twitter. Um, I spend way too much time on there. So I'm happy to talk to people and connect with people on there. Um, and just that one, I'm, I've seen lots of these kind of presentations and things, and there's so many links and things you all have to note down. So I've tried to make this easy. So if you do optimize.com forward slash CSM for Cambridge social media, then you can see the slides. So all the kind of links and all those bits you think, oh, I haven't a, put that on the screen for not too long. And it was, it was quickly gone away again. If you just remember one link from this whole thing, optimizey.com forward slash CSM, then you can get the slides and all the other links will be available in there. Okay. So a little bit about what we're going to go through today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how search engines work. Um, don't worry, it's not too technical and boring. Um, I'll try and make it interesting. We're not going to go really into the guts of how they really work, but just a few interesting bits about that and why you should care. Um, we're going to look at some of the ways that Google assesses content. Um, so you can think about what Google sees and how they see that and what, what that should mean for you and your content. Uh, keywords and how that affects your content, some of that kind of stuff, those are kind of queries, those things that people put into Google, that's going to come up and hopefully be interesting. And then some tools and tips to help you with all of this kind of stuff, because there's a whole bunch of things we're going to go through today. And hopefully some tools and some ideas and stuff that I picked up from doing what I do um, to help you do this a little bit more easily and less painfully. Okay. So a little bit about how search engines work. So this is a huge oversimplification. So please don't quote me too heavily on this, but basically Google does it like this. They crawl the web, they index the web, and then they rank stuff. And this is actually, they do it in that order. So they crawl stuff first, they index it, and then they rank it. And this is really time consuming and expensive for Google. If you ever see any of these kind of photos online of like Google's kind of warehouses where they store their servers, they're kind of like the size of small cities they have more electricity consumption than most cities and all that kind of stuff. They're huge. It's really expensive because there's a lot of stuff on the web, right? I think the last count, somebody, there's 130 trillion things on the web from like PDFs, images, web pages, all that kind of 130 trillion, which is just like an unfathomable amount of money, amount of money, amount of stuff. And that takes an unfathomable amount of money for Google to kind of keep up with all that stuff. Um, because I think it's around, so Google has to reveal this in some court case they did recently. There's about 2 trillion searches a year that people do on Google from all these different kind of different places you can search. So that's a lot of stuff. So what does that actually mean for you? So this is how it breaks down for you as a kind of website owner, somebody producing content. So the crawling stuff is, does it work? Can Google get to it? Can Google, you know, get through all your kind of firewalls and bits and pieces? Does it actually break and fall over? Does it take three hours to load all those kind of stuff? So the blue bit, the crawling is, does it work? Can Google find it and see it? Um, the indexing is, is it any good? Like now they found it, was it worth finding? And then the ranking is, okay, but does actually anybody want it? Um, the kind of analogy I use for this is like a big warehouse. If you imagine one of those huge Amazon warehouses, the kind of crawling is how, what have we got in the, where, in the warehouse? How many different things are there? You know, we've got 15 of those, 3000 of those, whatever it is. The red is the kind of indexing the bit about like kind of sorting it all out and like, you know, have we got any of these and are they actually any good? How much are we going to sell them for? All that kind of stuff. And the ranking is kind of like the shelves. If you imagine that kind of, you know, the, when they do those displays in the supermarket, like where are we going to put it on the shelves? Is this really good? We're going to put it at the top. We're going to put this right by the tills because it's really cool. Or we're going to kind of hide this over way down by the toilets because nobody really cares about that stuff. So that's how you need to think about your content and how Google goes through those kind of things. And what bits of your site this affects? The blue and the crawling is the technical stuff. Um, that's where you kind of talk to your IT guys and girls um, about whether your site actually works and doesn't fall over and runs quickly and, you know, Googlebot can get through to all the bits it needs. Um, indexing is the content, which we're going to hopefully spend a bit more time on today. And then ranking it is your kind of audience research that kind of do, do people want it? What do they look for on Google when they want it? If they want to buy that thing that you sell and they don't know what it's called, you know, do they search for, you know, ways to keep my feet warm in winter? Oh, socks. Great. Lovely. So that's the kind of stuff that those breaks down when you're going through your things. So we're going to spend obviously more most of our time talking about content today. 
because I could rattle on about all the others for ages and ages, but nobody wants that. We're going to try and keep it down, focus down to content. So if you listen to Google, Google says, just create great content. Don't worry about anything else. I got it because Google's got your back and all they need for you to do is create good content, which if that was true, then one, I wouldn't have a job. And two, this would be a really, really short presentation because it could just stop right here. So we're going to go on the assumption that Google is kind of like bending the truth a little bit with that. And you need to do a little bit more than just create good content. Also, we come to that definition of what is good content. More on that later. Because you still see stuff like this. So this was taken from a Facebook group that I'm in. I'm sure you've probably all seen or heard or read things like this. And it's this kind of thing where people say like, oh, your homepage needs or whatever page it is needs a 500 word count needs to have this many words whatever to get given credibility because there's more to SEO than keywords. I mean, they're kind of I've muted and blurred people's faces stuff to hide, uh, particularly and not so innocent. But I'm sure you've all kind of seen this kind of stuff where you've got to have this kind of word count and keyword density and all these other kind of buzzwords that are thrown around. I mean, they have got the bit right about there's more to SEO than keywords, but otherwise the rest of this is all just horrifying. So please forget all this kind of stuff about keyword counts and uh, keyword density and all that kind of stuff. It's rubbish. And you don't need to take my word for it. Here is just a few examples of like me searching for Google telling you that this is not, so like there's articles here about word count is not a ranking factor. There's this chap called John Moo, so the guy with all the bananas on his Twitter um, profile. But he's uh, the kind of like Google liaison. So he talks to lots of website owners and SEO folks like me and he's really helpful chap on, um, on Twitter. But he's sort of, you know, his quotes from him saying word count is not indicative of quality. I mean, just because you've got 500 words, there might be 500 rubbish words. Um, there's a Reddit post that he did about like, you know, word counts, not a ranking factor. So just stop it. John Moon's helpful chat. So this is him as Drake, a uh, lovely little meme one of my friends did. Um, so writing words to fulfill an imaginary word count and keyword density factor. We don't want any of that. Creating useful content that serves an actual purpose. Because we've all seen this kind of stuff, right? Recipe sites are an absolute classic for these. So you want, okay, you want to bake an apple pie. So you Google like, oh, best apple pie recipe. And you'll get like 2000 words of the author waxing lyrical about how this, you know, recipe was passed down to them by their grandmother and how they used to always like, you know, swing on the rope from the apple tree in her garden. And then they pickled the apples that would fall and, da, da, da. and eventually like, you know, 2000 words later, they get to the apple recipe and you just want the apple pie recipe. You don't really care about their kind of history and like, you know, the novel ways they found out about this kind of stuff. So people try and like bump up their word count to try and get you through to this thing. Um, another good example of this kind of stuff is, you know, when you search for what's the time in, I don't know, Toronto. So you got a meeting with somebody in Toronto and people would go through this whole thing about like, oh, what's the history of GMT and like how many different um, time zones are there in Canada? You don't care. Just tell me the time in Toronto. I don't want 500 words on the time in Toronto. I want like three or four digits that says it's 9 a.m. in Toronto. That's it. So think about what your users want. Create useful content that serves an actual purpose, not trying to just bloat your word count because the SEO guy said that you probably should not good. So how do you know what is good content? How does Google define what good content is? And this is a really cool thing because Google have this thing called the quality raters guidelines. So they actually have hundreds and hundreds of tests that Google are running all the time on different algorithms and different ways to format their search results and all this kind of stuff. And they have literally groups of people called quality raters who they'll show, you know, search results A and search results B and they'll get them to rate it and say, okay, and if we, show, if we tweak this with the algorithm, so these sites went rank higher for this query for, I don't know, buy socks in Cambridge, and we tweak them in this kind of way to say, these websites rank higher in buy socks in Cambridge, which of the results is better? Which of the websites that come back are better? And so they give these guidelines that Google write to these quality raters to tell them how to evaluate whether a website is any good or not. And you can read them. They're openly available on the web. So it's a really long and hideous URL. So I've shortened it down there. So optimize.com forward slash QRG. So quality raters guidelines. You can go look at them. They are 168 pages. So I'm going to try and pick out some succinct bits for you a bit later. But if you want to read 168 pages, knock yourself out. If you don't, there are some people that I recommend you can read stuff from. So there's a lady called uh, Marie Haynes. Uh, she is great. She writes about the quality raters guidelines a lot. And another lady based in New York called Lily Ray. Uh, they write about the QRG a lot and pick out the kind of good bits from when it changes there or the first people on it and stuff. So they're definitely worth looking out. So assuming you don't want to read the 168 pages, there's this other thing that Google wrote. And they actually wrote this back in 2011. This is written by a guy called Amit Singhal, who was the, um, their senior VP, VP of Google. And he wrote 23 questions. So these 23 questions to ask yourself about your content 
to see if it's any good. So this is all about building quality content. So these are the kind of tw questions that Google is effectively asking of your content. Even that 23 question is probably a little bit much. And even on the slides, you're probably thinking, oh, I can't read that. So I've done some work for you. I've picked out all the bits in there. So the green bits are where they're looking for things that are positive and good about it. And the red things are where they're kind of looking for things that are bad, that can give them signals that's maybe not so good. Even that might be a little bit too much. So here you go, I've sliced this even down further down for you. So here's all the green stuff all compiled together. And you can see the stuff they're looking for. They're looking for, is it trustworthy? Is it written by an expert? Would you be comfortable giving them your credit card information? Is there some quality control, like, you know, editorially, are you looking at things? Are you presenting both sides of the story? If you're saying about like, all right, you know, carrots cure cancer, is your article also kind of considering the fact that maybe carrots don't in all, in all, all cases? Uh, it's well edited. Are you a recognized authority on this? So, and if you're like me and you're writing about SEO, that's great. But if you're then going to write about lobotomies, what expertise have you got to write about lobotomies? Is it comprehensive? Are you going beyond the obvious? Is it, you know, is it just another one of these 8,000 recipes for the best apple pie? What are you adding that's new and original and inventive? So all this kind of stuff. So these are the kind of positive things that Google's looking for to see if your content's any good. And here's all the bad stuff. Is it shallow? their spelling and stylistic mistakes in there. Google does know, they know how to spell things. Of course, you know, there's difference in American and English spellings and stuff, but you know, if it looks junk and is written junk and there's, there's spelling mistakes and formatting stuff, I mean, hopefully the copywriters amongst you are rejoicing because you're really like, you know, yes, Google actually looks for this stuff too. I can really, you know, continue to be a grammar and spelling pedant because it is important. Is it mass produced? You know, is it one of these kind of copy and paste articles that appears like with slight variations on about 19 different pages? Um, is it unsubstantial? Would users complain after they've read this kind of stuff? So these are the kind of things that Google is looking for to give them hints that your content is not so good. Okay. How does this actually then affect what you're doing next? So go remember this kind of crawling, indexing, ranking stuff that we talked about. So we anthropomorphize all of this. So all of this stuff that Google does on your website when it's crawling, indexing, ranking us SEO folk, we talk about Googlebot. Um, that's not the name that we made up. So when you have a user agent, so that little thing that kind of comes and crawls your website when it kind of leaves a trail of who it is, Google call it Googlebot. So Googlebot will visit your website and look at all these kind of things. So how does Googlebot respond when they're going through your website? So how do they understand your content? So they're looking at a brand new page that you've just published on your website. And this is how Googlebot goes through your stuff, literally in this order, top to bottom. They look at the URL first. They look at the page title that you set. They look at the meta description that you set. They look at the headings to so that kind of summary. So H1s, H2s, H3s, hopefully you're using all of those kind of things. That's how they kind of, you know, if you imagine you kind of skim read it, you'll pick out the headings first and then they look at the content. So all that time you're spending like hours and hours writing that beautiful blog post, that's the fifth thing they get to. So they haven't even got to the content. They've done all those other things first. So that's how Googlebot goes through your content. And it's helpful, I think, sometimes to look at like a real life example of how this like works. So all those fields, remember all those things, URLs, page title, meta descriptions, this is how they look when they show up in the search results. So this is the results for what makes a good SEO page title. And you can see that the blue bit at the top, that's the page title. They're literally pulling the page title from your page and putting that into the blue bit. The green bit that appears underneath, that's the URL. And then the method description is the bit they pull in the black text that comes in there afterwards. So there, of course, are always variations on that. Google sometimes will overwrite them and change them. And as Google does, like mess with things. But largely, these are where they put those fields. Um, so having some look at, let's have a look at some real life examples. So in a previous life, I used to work for the Royal Society of Chemistry in Cambridge. And here's a URL from their website. So if you're Googlebot and you're looking at this and then you come to this new page and you look at the URL first, does this URL tell you anything about what the page is about? And the answer, of course, is no, because that's why Googlebot's looking all confused. That's a big question mark that I've added because the URL doesn't tell you, it doesn't say anything about you know, this page is about chemistry or this page is about the chemistry chemical reaction of the sun or whatever it is. It's just a string of numbers and letters. So if you're looking at your URLs and your website and they have this kind of stuff, stop that. You want to make them much more descriptive. Okay, so let's assume that Googlebot's completely confused. They've looked at the URL, it's not helping them very much. They're going to go on and look at the page title for this page. Here's the page title for this page. It's a lovely little mouthful. I hope uh, there might be some scientists among you this will mean a little bit more to, but it means nothing to me. But anyway, here's the page title towards stable and efficient electrolytes for room temperature rechargeable calcium batteries. Energy and environmental science RSC publishing. Not bad. They're getting better. It's a little, it's a little bit wordy, but it's science, so they need to be a bit wordy. The issue they've got with this is Google can't fit all that kind of stuff in. It's way too long. Page title is too long. Actually, what happens is it crops it off of that. 
So we've gone from talking about batteries to now towards stable and efficient electrolytes from room temperature. Completely changes the context of the article because when you see it in the search results, this is what it looks like in the search results. You get that kind of ellipsis, the three dots after room temperature because it can't fit the rest into the page. So now we've got a page that was about batteries that now says towards stable and efficient electrolytes from room temperature. So maybe it's about thermometers, maybe it's about you know degrees of Celsius in the average living room, whatever, I don't know. So now the, that kind of thing where the page title is getting cropped off, that's important. Okay, so Google bots confused by the URL. The page title is not helping a great deal because it's way too long. So how, how would this page do for the meta description? Here's the meta description for this page. Stumbleweed, there's nothing. They didn't fill in the meta description at all. So that doesn't help them a great deal. The, uh, the sharp eyed amongst you will have noticed that actually back here, there is a meta description. So if I can do my little pointer, you can see this kind of thing. This is Google then basically trying to fill in the blanks that you left because the page didn't have a meta description. Google guessed. So it kind of goes to your page and will nick stuff. So if you leave them blank, it's okay. Google will still try and find a way, but you're just missing an opportunity for you to optimize it, for you to really sell your page when you appear with all those other 10 sites that do really similar things to you. Does your meta description really sell that page for you? Um, it's worth noting the meta description is not a ranking factor. So you don't need to worry so much about keywords and those kind of things in those pages in terms of affecting your ranking, but it is a ranking factor in terms of it will help people convince them to see your page. So when you, you appear in those kind of 10 results on a Google page, which one is going to stand out to me? And let's have a look at why this kind of stuff matters. So here's a search for how to become an RSC member. So you want to be a member of the RSC. Here's all the results and Google's trying to help you. So it looks at these kind of things. It's looking and all these little red arrows and me picking out these words. So it folds them up. This is only on desktop. It doesn't appear so much on mobile. But again, you can see where it's picking out these words. So members, and being, it's like, these aren't even in my search, so it's got synonyms from become. It's kind of worked out that, okay, being is kind of in the ballpark of become. We've got member, membership. Okay, right, so it's kind of picking out the words that I searched for to show me, yes, these pages are gonna match up to your results. So choosing those words very carefully in your meta description, in your page title, in your URL, this is why it matters. Okay, how do we do this better then? So if you've got all these things and you know you wanna get keywords and all these kind of things, you wanna get all the right queries, what are the kind of tools that can help you? The biggest one that loads of people miss is Google. So looking at those search results. So when you have a search result or a query that you want to rank for, go and have a look at Google. What is currently ranking for that? Is it any good? Maybe you know you need to find that content and do a bit better. So having a look at Google, seeing which words Google is relating to it, you know, what are the other kind of things, you know, what's the content that it's ranking? Is it really short? Is it kind of just here's an apple pie recipe the end? Here's the time it's Toronto the end, or is it ranking stuff that it does really like go hugely in depth? So that's a good clue about what kind of stuff Google is looking for. Um, there's another tool called Google Trends, which is great. Um, often makes the um, newspaper headlines and uh, on the news kind of things because we, you see these kind of spikes in searches. So a good one was like the day after the Brexit vote, uh, the num massive surge in, in searches for what is the EU. And just after Trump got elected, there was a massive surge in searches for how do I emigrate to Canada? So it's these kind of things you can see like the trends of like, you know, when people are searching more for things or not, and it will give you comparisons and Google Trends will show you, okay, well, not many people search for this, but actually they do search for this, which is kind of similar and way more people search for that. So then you can try to optimize your content around that. Google Search Console is another massive one that lots of people overlook. So lots of people have analytics, but they kind of forget about Search Console. It's a kind of similar, um, thing and it has a little bit snippet of code that you put on your site to match it up. Um, but it gives you lo literally information about how Google sees your website. So if you don't have Google Search Console set up, please, please, please get it set up. It's free. It's really quick to do. And it literally gives you that kind of direct information about somebody typed in this search and your website showed, it showed, you know, first, fifth, ninth, 29th, whatever it is. Um, I'll leave the other ones there for you to kind of find out for yourself. Um, I've got a, li a little box over there on the right hand side sort of showing um, some hints about sort of the length of page types that you want to be aiming for, less than 60 characters, meta descriptions between 50 and 160 characters. Um, but there is a caveat with that. Google changed these often, as of course they always have a want to do. They'll vary from different device mobiles and desktops will have different uh, thresholds and stuff. So always check these, try and see them yourself. Um, that link at the bottom is um, a link to a tool which will help you kind of see what they would look like when you mess with those different meta descriptions and uh, title lengths. So you can see what they would look like before you publish your page. So that's kind of helpful too. Um, some last little tips, um, how to use Google. So that kind of hint about or use Google to um, see what the results look like. There's some really cool things you can do within Google search to help you do this stuff even better. Um, some site uh, search operators. So you can do these kind of things where you put in site colon optimizing.com 
and Google will bring you back results just from that website. Or you can do related colon, so related to nike.com or your website, whatever it is. If some of you are really small, like kind of, you know, one or two person banned businesses, Google might not have some related things, but, you know, related businesses to Nike, it will come back with Reebok and Adidas and Sports Direct, whatever those kind of things. So it's an interesting way for you to see who does Google associate you with, what kind of businesses are Google thinking you're like. Um, you can do in URL, so you can find in URL. So I've done Link Kopova for this one because uh, Link is kind of running the show. Uh, thanks, Dana, you as well. I didn't do this for you. Um, but you can do those kind of things where you can put, you know, does, does um, this page or do, find me pages on the web that have Link Kopova in the URL or in the title or those kind of things. So you can use these kind of search operators. Again, there's a link at the bottom of this slide when you get the slide deck. We can do a whole kind of load, a whole bunch of search operators that will really help you get Google to work even harder for you and find all these kind of things because it can help you do stuff like this. So you go to your domain, so you could do a site, yourdomain.co.uk and that phrase that you want to rank for. So the example I've done here is site cambridgesocial.media. So link uh, the site for this and then Instagram. So which of the pages on Linker's site rank for the word Instagram? And is it the ones you expect to rank? Is it the ones that rank, do they rank in the right order? Is your page like, you know, selling Instagram training courses, the one that you want to rank, but actually that's appearing third because you've got this really popular blog post. So that again is a good way to try and find those kind of things that, um, that maybe not quite right the way you would like them set up in your site. Um, because if you're, you know, say a random blog post is outranking your big sales page, then maybe you need to look at things like internal linking. So whenever you talk about Instagram, do you link to your Instagram page internally? Because that's a really big clue to Google where it's like, you know, I've got 50 pages on Linker's website. There, the, All these 50 pages are about Instagram. I don't know which is the most important one. If every time you talk about Instagram on your website, you internally link back to your Instagram training course page, then Google gets the hint that, okay, this must be the most important page on this website about Instagram. So I'll rank this one higher than these other ones. They'll still appear, but that kind of ordering. Again, there's a great tool uh, linked to from the bottom there, um, a tool uh, built by a company over in Culture Street, actually strategic. Um, and there's ways you can plug in some of your data from analytics and search console to help you find those kind of cannibals where you're kind of competing against yourself a little bit. Okay, recap. Did a little bit about how search engines work and why that was interesting. We did a little bit how Google assesses content, the quality raters, guidelines, those kind of things. We did a little about keywords and content and some tools and tips. So hopefully that's been a, a bit of a lightning spin through how Google sees content and how you can do some cool stuff to make your content even better for SEO. I'm done. Wow, thank you. <laughs> there is lots of information. I was like trying to, to get them all done on my no. <laughs> So this was really, really fantastic. Um, I, I like the part where you had the 23 questions and you just started like, okay, that's a lot. We'll just go down. <laughs> and nobody, nobody wants to read that. Yeah. I, ha I have to admit, I have read the 168 pages of the quality readers guidelines. Yeah. It, yeah. it is interesting for me. Yeah, as but like I remember last time I was working on an SEO project, Lenka has shared with me a link. Um, I forgot the name of the person who prepared it, but he had like three hundred uh, list of tips about SEO, and I had to go through all of them and basically read it and be like, I don't even understand this. <laughs> okay. Is it Mark Williams Cook? Maybe he has like. It might have been him. It's, it's from from LinkedIn post and mm. like over three Un unsolicited SEO tips. Yeah, I think so. And he every day he records one SEO tip, so it was, yeah. it was really. Yeah, it sounds like Mark. He's a good chap. Yeah, if you if you haven't found his stuff on LinkedIn, so I think it's Mark Williams Cook. He does um he calls them unsolicited SEO tips. So basically, him sort of forcing his advice on you, but it's really good. It's yeah. really really short and sweet, and it's really good to useful stuff. Yeah, exactly. And also the part where, you know, like it doesn't matter how many keywords you, you not how many keywords, how many words you have. And as long as that uh, are your keywords are, are there. Um, I do have some questions. Um, so we had a question that you actually uh, answered, but one of the questions is how to incorporate it, uh, how to incorporate the um, the keywords with the rest of the content and connect different forms of content with one SEO strategy. So you have an SEO strategy, you have lots of content and you have lots of keywords. How do you incorporate it into one, one strategy basically? Um, so there's a couple of facets to that. Um, so I guess that kind of thing about incorporating keywords and making sure you cover all the right queries, um, the sort of way that 
you should think about that or the way that I would advise thinking about that in, in terms of SEO is thinking about that kind of thoroughness. So you get people that will um, talk, I saw an example, terrible example today about, you know, digital marketing in Cambridge. And they found, they obviously just pumped it into a thesaurus or a synonym generator. And how many different ways can you say, you know, internet marketing in Cambridgeshire, digital marketing in Cambridge, you know, um, internet promotions near Ely. It's just like all the variations you could possibly, it was horrible. And they just jammed them all in. It didn't read naturally. It was ugly and horrible. Um, but you do need that, the, again, with all these kind of crappy, spammy tech tactics, there is a grain of truth in, the, in them because you do need that kind of thoroughness around a topic. So if you're going to talk about, so the example I often use is Mother Teresa, you're going to talk about Mother Teresa, you do need to mention none. You do need to mention Calcutta. You do need to mention Christianity. You do need to mention the Pope. You do need to mention all these kind of things that, you know, as a human, you would think, oh, right, you know, it's that topic. Google understands that kind of, they talk about in terms of entities. So you, me, a table, a dog, a place, a city, a country, an aeroplane, they're all entities. And Google understands the kind of things that are related to those entities. And if you're not thoroughly covering a topic, then you're going to struggle to rank. Um, how you do that in terms of and the other kind of facet of the question, I think, was about how you sort of incorporate that into a strategy. Um, I guess the way to think about that is um, a little bit towards that kind of thing I talked about at the end in terms of internal linking. If you're going to talk about Instagram a lot, you know, if you're talking about social media, you're going to mention Instagram a hundred different ways in a hundred different blog posts. You're going to have it here and there and everywhere and on your homepage and in this kind of thing. If Google is looking at your website and they want to know which page from your website is the most or the best or the most important about Instagram, which page should it be? If they want to look for, if somebody is searching for something really specific, like how do I use hashtags in Instagram, you might have a blog post or a piece of pillar content that really specifically talks about hashtags. But if you've got kind of this overall grouping around, okay, well, this is just the main page for Instagram, then you need to internally link. Every time you talk about Instagram, you need to link back to your Instagram page and say, okay, this is the mother load of Instagram content. Yes, we've got stuff about hashtags and, you know, live streams and the best people to follow and all these kind of things. but um, a, good, a good way to think about uh, this is um, the newspaper websites. They always do this really well with big sports tournaments. So it's like a big soccer World Cup. And the Telegraph talks about the soccer World Cup 100 times a day because there's this, this footballer's fractured an eyelash and they're not going to be able to play on Saturday. And then this football has been sent off and this guy's been seen out drunk in bars, whatever. They have hundreds of stories all the time. But they always have this internal linking back to their World Cup hub page. So every time they talk about, oh, David Beckham's fractured his toe, so he's not going to be able to play, they link back to the England World Cup news page. Yeah. But then later in the day, the story changes and it's like, oh, actually, no, it's all right. We made it up. He's only got a fractured toenail. He's going to be fine. He's going to be fit to play. But the story still links back to here's the World Cup news hub page. So then when people search for, I want the latest World Cup news, they get the big hub page. Yeah. What is your, um, what's your uh, advice for, um, you know, readability of the content? And um, I know that, for example, it, it's, it's Google also, uh, SEM Rush usually uh, recommends that your content should be readable or easy to consume. Um, so maybe you can just have a few, few tips about that, like what makes a content easy to consume and readable? So I think a lot of that depends on your audience. So I'm trying to avoid like the SEO, classic SEO answer for every question, it depends. Um, but with this kind of stuff, it depends on who your audience is. Like if you're aiming at, I don't know, university age students and 90% of them are reading on their phone and they're all reading at kind of 10 o'clock in the morning while they're just having their breakfast and they've got three minutes and they're just spinning through stuff, then you need to make your content really short and bite sized and it needs to look lovely on a mobile screen. It needs to load super fast. If you're selling office furniture and you're talking mostly to office managers who are browsing in the middle of the day on a huge desktop with a lovely big screen like I'm sitting in front of now, then there's different kind of demands and expectations from that kind of content. So think about your audience, where they are, who they are, how they're digesting your content. You know, maybe they don't have a lot of time, maybe they're on a train and actually what they want is just like, you know, they've got headphones on like me, they're just in their little world on a train. Remember when we used to go on trains kind of pre-COVID? Anyway. But they, they want a video. They don't want to read 500 words about anything. They would just like somebody to explain it to them in three minutes. So like, you know, here's Dana. She's going to explain to you. Here's the news headlines for the day in three minutes. So this has happened. This has happened. This has happened. This has happened. This is why you should care. On you go. I would say that now that I'm thinking about it, that 
when when you have your heading as a question that people actually came to you because they asked questions so basically they're they're looking after you know like a direct answer so maybe bullet bullet points you know like lists usually 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 helps um what about graphics i know we have a few questions that um i'm seeing in uh and here but like just before we move in what about images and graphics i think lots of people miss on that um i know you didn't mention it like alt text then is it actually important um so alt text is important it's like it, with with seo it's all about marginal gains there are some things you'll do which will make a really big difference and there are like some things you do which make a really tiny difference but if you do enough of those tiny difference things then they all add up alt text i would say is in the kind of tiny difference category um, I think some people can get really carried away with it a little bit. Actually, the the majority, the main reason alt text was invented is to help people that are partially sighted or blind. So if they can't see your image and it's a lovely image of a dog, as I used at the beginning, then you know having an alt text that's empty doesn't help them a great deal. So describe what's in the, what's in the image, um, make it useful for people. You know, imagine it was your partially sighted mother, neighbor, friend, whatever that, that you needed to describe the image. Then that's the job of alt text. Um, if with SEO in mind, you can use it as a good way to kind of shoehorn in a few synonyms. So rather than dog, you might say, oh, it's a cute puppy. Then you can kind of help expand the reach of your content a little bit like that, rather than just repeating the word dog, which is already in your URL and already in your page title. And yeah. you can do a few things like that, but don't get too clever with alt text. Yeah. Side information about um, uh, these kind of uh, accessibility requirements for some industries in 2020, they became uh, a necessity for uh, gov.uk to basically rank you or like make your website. It's it's a regulation. I don't want to call it regulation, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, it's now uh, asked from certain uh, companies and in certain industry, uh, the ones I know are government, charity and education that they need yep. to, uh, um, make their website accessible for people with with uh, like sight or hearing impairment. Yeah, that's absolutely. Right. The W3C guidelines is the kind of benchmark that you're looking at for that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's important. Their website is among these industries to make sure that they are filling the requirements. Okay. Uh, we had we have a question. Uh, what should be the ideal readability factor for web content? I think uh, we talked about that. Um, someone is asking for the link that you mentioned on his last slide. Is it strategic? Uh, we will put the links in the, in oh, the links. Yeah. So if, if the only link you remember is optimizing.com forward slash CSM, so Cambridge Social Media, then you can get the slides and all the links and stuff in there. It's a PDF. It will take you straight to the PDF. There's no kind of like paywall or me kind of trying to trick you into giving me your mother's maiden name or whatever. Just optimizing.com for slash CSM. You get all the slides and stuff in there. Uh, we had a comment uh, from Sue Bailey. She's saying that um, she has redone her SEO is optimized, but now she's struggling for knowing what to redo for SEO, an SEO for the key pages. It mm -hmm. seems that if you are creating a portfolio based website, that SEO doesn't always feel so relevant. Why use of W-O-A-S-T for this is frustrating me. Actually. Yoast, Yoast, I think that might be uh, Y-O-A-S-T. Yeah. I think that's a kind of very famous uh, WordPress plugin that helps you with SEO stuff. Um, so two things on Yoast. One, it's great and there's definitely a place for Yoast and it's lovely. Um, the thing with that kind of stuff is it's the tool. So it, it, garbage in, garbage out. So lots of people I see are like, oh, my Yoast score is three green lights and you know I've used rank math and I've got 100 out of 100 and all that kind of stuff, but I'm still not getting any traffic. It's like, Yoast isn't an SEO person, like a consultant like me. It's just going to tell you you know, it's a box ticking exercise. Have you put a page title in? Have you put a meta description in? Have you put, you know, useful words in your URL? Do you feature your key? If you tell it the key, your keyword is dog food, and then you write your article about cat food, then you're going to fail. You'll get a red light. If you write a garbage article about dog food, it, and you say, oh, my keyword is dog food. It's going to go, hey, you mentioned dog food 500 times. Great. So Yoast is a useful tool and kind of like a, a memory jogger and stuff, but it, it, it's, it's box ticking. It won't tell you whether you've done it well, it will tell you you've done, you've checked the boxes. You might have done it awfully. 
Yeah. Um, I guess my, yeah, so that's the kind of caveat on used. Um, so what was the question again? About? I didn't, so she said, I have just had- oh, optimizing content. Read, yeah, yeah. re-optimizing her key pages, I think. Google Search Console is a great source for this. Get Google Search Console if you haven't already. Um, get it set up and then you can view it for a particular page. So you say your, your portfolio page is about, I don't know, the interiors you've designed for offices in Cambridge. You can go and look at your interiors design page in Search Console and it will tell you which queries people are putting in that brings up your page in the Google search results. And it will tell you which ones you're kind of ranking first, second, third, fourth, fifth. Look at the ones that you're ranking just beyond 10. So the first search results usually is one to 10 on the first, but if you're ranking kind of 11th, you're basically at the top of page two. So if you can go after those ones and look at those kind of things, oh, we, you know, we rank 11th for soft furnishings in Cambridgeshire. We'd quite like to rank a little bit higher for that, but oh, let's look at our content. Oh, we don't mention the word soft furnishings. We talk about sofas and chairs, and but we no, never mention that particular phrase soft furnishings. Let's see if we can weave that into our content and just tweak the content slightly to include that as a synonym, because we thought maybe we were going after sofas in Cambridge, but nobody searches for that. But actually loads of people search with it. Search Console will give you that information about, you know, 20,000 people searched this last month and you were so close. You were like silver medal position, you're top of page two. But if you make a slight tweak, then you can get yourself into page one. And the difference between being on page two of Google and being on page one of Google is night and day. There's huge amounts of clicks that you'll get if you're on page one, anywhere on page one, top three would be lovely, but anywhere on page one, top of page two is like the SEO joke is it's the best place to hide a dead body because nobody goes to page two of Google. Yeah. Okay, so we have a question from Fatih Ahmed and he's saying, ideally what should be the keyword strategy for a startup? Should it be high or medium or low volume keywords? <laughs> um, I mustn't say it depends, but it kind of depends. Um, if you're going into a super competitive space, then you're not going to you know, say you're you want to rank for casinos, you know, best casino website, or you know, all these kind of really super competitive things like you know, best holiday bookings. But you're going to really struggle to go from nowhere to being on page one. So it's much better to rank for like something much more. Um, low volume where fewer people search for it but it's much less competitive so if you have you know the best hotel rooms in Cambridge for people that you know want to take dogs and kids that's you know rather than ranking for hotels in Cambridge you got no chance you hopefully you might get there eventually if you build up you know links and you're going to build up the quality of your website and build out the strength and you know the offering that you have but if you're going to go from nowhere to ranking for hotels in Google good luck with um, yeah ranking for hotels in Cambridge good luck it, it's a long battle. Whereas if you rank for kind of slightly less competitive things that can then start to build up your credibility. And then, you know, then those kind of longer term ga uh, goals are slightly more achievable because you're starting from a higher base. So that doesn't really answer the question. Um, but it's hopefully a, a good starting point. because it, it depends. So you can use some of these tools like SEMrush and Moz to see how competitive these kind of queries and stuff are. So you might find you know, maybe you find a pot of gold, you'll find something that where there's 10,000 people searching for a month and the competition is rubbish and you can instantly rank number one and that'd be great. But it really depends on what kind of industry you're in. The industry you're in could be super competitive or really not very competitive at all. Nice. Okay, so um, the questions from the community are done. Uh, someone was saying, are short posts, uh, say 100 word, uh, words, worth doing? Uh, so the, with that kind of stuff, I'd say if it's useful, sure. So if, if you're writing a post about, you know, what's the time in Toronto or, you know, hey, if we found this new tool um, with a new way to, uh, somebody was asking about like, what's the best uh, Instagram hashtag generator. So if you like, oh, we've just found this new tool. We haven't really tested it out much for ourselves, but we want to be the first one to get there with this news. You know, there's, you know, thanarasad.com is the best Instagram hashtag generator ever. You should totally go to that that's a useful post for your audience. And then maybe you want to build up on it later once you've tried it out and you've got some screenshots and say, think about what's useful for your, don't be that recipe website that writes 60,000 website words about the history of your mum's apple pie recipe. Yeah. Think about what's useful for your audience. Yeah. Uh, someone asked like, what is a valuable content that actually brings conversion? Mm -hmm. um, so something I didn't mention, which I meant to talk about in my, um, slides with uh, these kind of acronyms. So if you go through that 168 page document, there are a couple of acronyms which Google bring up quite a lot. So one of them is EAT, so EAT, um, and that's expert, expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. 
So they are looking for those kind of things. That's kind of like a summary of those 23 questions, if you like. So are you an expert? Are you authoritative? And is your content trustworthy? Um, another one is YMYL. So your money or your life. So there are certain thresholds. So those 23 questions, there are different thresholds that Google will dial up and down depending on what you're talking about. If you're talking about cancer and mortgages and pensions and you know care homes and nursing and health, all those kind of things that, that affect your money or your life, then those thresholds for trustworthiness and expertise are going to be way higher because they don't want to put Andrew random Cambridge blogger at the top of the search results saying, Hey, I found the cure for cancer. And it's, you know, you just need to try this one neat trick uh, three times a day and send me $3,000. They mm -hmm. don't want to rank me above the NHS and all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. If you're writing about like, you know, my favorite football team and you know, what my dog wears at the weekend, they don't expect so much expertise or authority. Mm -hmm trustworthiness in those areas so you can get away with you know slightly lower standard of quality of content in those kind of things as you would expect you know if you're asking your friend to give you advice about a cancer doctor you would expect them to take it much more seriously than if you're asking them advice about like you know what color to paint your nails tomorrow so that kind of stuff um i guess in terms of what makes quality content um to answer the question that came up um even as an seo person i I don't think that SEO is the be all and end all of everything. So if you have content that is bringing you business and driving sales and um, bringing you leads and making you loads of money, but it ranks 95th on Google, who cares? If it's making you money, that's, that's doing its job really. So find the content that works for your audience that, you know, that people really want and in, engage with and brings them along your kind of sales funnel. If the content's working, you'll know soon enough. Yeah. Um, I remember uh, reading um, in an article, I forgot who wrote it down, but some of the modifiers for conversion specifically, that there are certain words you can use is like how to, using the year in your title, uh, the word review, best, top, buy, easy, tips, this mm -hmm. kind of, you know, like more like a clickbait uh, <laughs> type sure. of words, but if, if they are relevant, I think, you know, like buy things like that. And usually when it comes to conversion, honestly, when, whenever I'm writing content uh, for web or digital marketing, social media, there should be a clear uh, call to action with your content. If you yeah. want people to convert, what is your conversion goal? Is it, is it subscription? Is it uh, to read? Is it to watch? Is it to buy? Uh, whatever it is, use those words because they're basically telling your audience what you want from them um, and this on its own is a good for conversion yeah that's a great point so that kind of that in seo we call that kind of matching intent so you get that kind of intent shift um, a good example is where people search for liverpool manchester and 364 days a year what they want is travel plans they want you know they want to get a train from liverpool to manchester or they want to know how long it takes to drive for one or two days a year when they put liverpool manchester they mean the football match because it's happening tomorrow and liverpool and manchester are playing each other and so google literally switches around the search results so the same search result will bring you very different results depending on which day of the year you search like if it's the liverpool manchester derby match is happening that next weekend the results will all be about football and then you know three or four weeks in, and it's not the football season anymore that same search will bring you stuff about how to travel um so try and match up the intent. If you've got a page that's um, selling stuff and it's a really pushy, like kind of call to action page about, you know, buy this, buy this, buy this, buy this, and the content you're trying to rank against and the content that Google is preferring and the content the audience clearly want as well is more informational because say it's something really complex like medicine, you probably don't want to buy it straight away. You're just trying to find out a little bit of information. You want to you know, do some research in the background. Maybe it's more of a soft sell. It's like, okay, we haven't decided yet. So, you know, come back and get some more information anytime. Here's this video, sign up for our newsletter. You know, you don't have to give us any money yet. And you're trying to push, push, push that sell. That's an intent mismatch. So that's when you're kind of struggle where if Google's trying to give information and you're trying to give sales or the other way around, you know, if Google's trying to give sales, you know, somebody's put in, I want to buy dog food in Cambridge and you're going, oh, here's the best places that you might try to feed your dog. It's a bit, I don't want that. I just want to buy some flipping dog food. Yeah. So you need to have that kind of intent match. Yeah. Uh, we have a question about uh, content management tips and tools. Maybe this is, uh, yeah, tips and tools about content management. Um, yeah, I guess that, that's it. That's, I need a bit more information on that question. So I'm not sure whoever asked that. Maybe they want to find me on Twitter and um, give me a bit more information about what they mean about that. 
Okay, we have last one from Tim Morris. Is SEO any good for short-term sales such as events? I tried it and it was essentially robbery with the PPC. Any suggestions? <laughs> I thought his question was going to stop at is SEO any good? And I was like, I can answer that one. Um, for short-term stuff, it's, so PPC if, is um, like people who are not clear about that. It's the, it's the Google Ads where you kind of pay to be ranked at the top. Um, and the great thing about PPC is it is instant. So you can, if you, it's a kind of auction thing. So if you bid two pounds and I bid three pounds, then I appear at the top generally. I mean, there are a few more kind of nuances than that. But you can buy your way to the top really quickly, but it does hose through your money super fast. You know, there are some keywords and things that you can bid for, which are really competitive, like hotels in Cambridge. And it'd be costing you like 10, 15, 20 pounds a click, which if you're making 50, 100, 200 pounds a click, then that's fine. Um, but yeah, it can munch through your budget really quick. And as soon as your budget goes, then you're nowhere. So SEO is much more of a kind of long-term plan to get you from page three to page two to page one, and then hopefully keep you there if you're doing a good job. Um, with events and stuff, that can be tricky because by definition, they're kind of transient. So you build this page, which is lovely, and you get all these people talking about your event, and then your event's over, and so it's pointless Google ranking you anymore. What I would advise with that kind of stuff and what I've done with my own events is, again, you have that kind of hub page. So if people are looking for SEO events in Cambridge, they don't or usually don't find my latest event page. They'll find the hub page that talks about all my events. So here's all these events we do and like what, kind, what the events are like and where they are and the kinds of speakers that we get and how much tickets cost, they're free or whatever, but all that kind of stuff is general information about SEO events in Cambridge. And then I'll do specific ones about, you know, we've got this talk next week from so-and-so, we've got this talk the week after from so-and-so. And again, that kind of hub where you link back to the main page about his SEO events in Cambridge. So something I've seen uh, lots of big event sites do really well is um, they kind of turn over the page so it will be about so Turing Fest. So it's Turing Fest 2019. They build this lovely page, get loads of links to it, and then they used to back in the day bin off the old page and start again from scratch. Not a good idea because you've just wasted all the effort you've built on that page. So you have one page for Turing Fest, and then you have a sub page for 2019, and a sub page for 2020, and a sub page for 2021. But you build all your equity and your effort in ranking the mother load page. So here is events about coding and programming or what or, you know events about interiors or dog food or whatever it is your events are about build that one hub page rank that page and then build your subsequent event pages stemming off that yeah since we're on that topic sometimes it, uh, since we're talking about uh, events when you search in events on google now you actually get a list of events that are happening in your place so how do you Spooky, get in it how do you get on that? So where do you put it so that it actually shows that in this area, these this are the events happening today or this week or this month? So this is Google again, trying to be really helpful. And I think we kind of overlapped a little bit with that when we talked about questions and like you were suggesting about putting bullet points and things to break up your content to make it really obvious about what it is. So Google, um, some people talk about it trying to be an answer engine rather than a search engine. What they want to do is they want to connect you with the best answer. So if you're searching for, you know, what should I do this weekend? It doesn't want to send you to another website where like, you know, you might find 10 top things to do in Cambridge. It wants to go, here you go. Here's a list of really cool things to do in Cambridge. And we already know where they all are. And we rank them all. And here's where all the addresses are and blah, all that kind of stuff. A lot of that is fed by um, a thing called schema or rich data. So that's a way to mark up stuff on your website in the background to make it really clear about what stuff is. So the, the example with this is when you have like a product page selling a shoe. So there's hundreds of numbers on that page, all about the shoe, the size, the weight, you know, the SKU number, the barcode, the price, the delivery cart, all those things, number, 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 number. And search engines aren't human. So they're like, I don't know what any of this means. But if you can mark it up with schema, you can say very clearly to search engines, this number is the price. This number is the barcode. This number is the stock level. This number is the weight. This number is the width. All those, and you can make it really clear about what all those numbers mean. And with events, you can do that. You can say, right, this is the address of the event. This is the ticket price. This is the location. Here's the postcode of the address. Here's the dress code. Here's the, who the speakers are. And you can mark up this particular this schema for everything. So if you go to schema.org, so it's S-C-H-E-M-A.org. There's a schema for everything. There's literally a schema to mark up um, public toilets. So you can mark up a public toilet, say whether it's, you know, is it in a library or, you know, does it have a lockable door or there's schema for everything, but Google will try and pull certain schema into the search results to say, okay, right, here's a list of events that are in Cambridge. So here's the date, the time, the location, the address, all that kind of stuff. And that, that's how it, it, it does that kind of stuff. So when you use sites like uh, Meetup, Meetup 
puts a lot of that kind of stuff into the background for you. You don't need Meetup to do it. You can mark it up on your website, your own website if you want. So a scheme is just a way to make that kind of um, content even clearer to search engines. Making your content clear to search engines is never a bad idea. A confused search engine makes confused users and messy results. Yeah, reminds me of my trip uh, back in, before all this happened to Paris and literally all of my searches were for to about public toilets. <laughs> it was so cruel. They don't let you use toilets if you're not going to buy coffee or ice creams or things. So yeah, we have uh, we have two last questions. Um, one from Fatih, and he's saying, "Is it okay to use spinners to produce content?" Spinners. Spinners. So uh, I'm assuming he means like automated robots that kind of write your content for you. I'm, I'm going to say no without. <laughs> I mean, is it Fatter who asked? So again, I'm I'm taking a jump here, Fatter. I think you mean spinners. So yes, you can pay these services that will just spin you out content. Um, if if you've ever read that content, it's 99 times out of 100 not good. So I don't use spinners. I don't recommend my clients use them. Um, it's usually pretty spammy and awful websites to use them. The language use is fairly questionable. Um, I would recommend avoiding those. Yeah. Okay, last question from uh, James. Does social media affect crawling, indexing, and ranking in any way? Example, would posting a, on Twitter mean Google might crawl page faster? The answer to that, honestly, is nobody knows. So even the people at Google are fairly sketchy on that. Um, so lots of people will tell you, oh, yes, you need social signals and all this kind of stuff to help your content to rank. Um, I would suggest that if you're using social media as a way to get Google to notice your content, you've got bigger problems than that. So if you've got a good website that's clearly structured with a sitemap in place and it's crawlable and indexable and all those lovely things we talked about at the beginning that Google can find it easily to, easily to get your content, um, then you shouldn't need to worry too much about that. If, if Google is ignoring your content and not indexing it as quickly as you would like, then you may have bigger problems in play than that. Um, it certainly can help in certain instances if lots of people are talking about stuff. So um, a good example of this particularly is in like news media where um, say that, you know, there'll be breaking news that, you know, I don't know, tomorrow Trump abdicates and, you know, decides he wants to invade Poland or whatever that would be happening really quickly. And there'd be lots of, you know, so Google will look at certain websites um, more regularly. So like news websites or the Times, Telegraph, CNN, all that, like Google is checking them on a minute by minute basis. Um, so things like that, where, you know, you'll get a sudden surge of people searching for, you know, Trump abdicates or whatever it is, then social media does, I think, play a role in that. Again, that's me, I think. I can't prove it, I don't know. Um, but in my experience then, um, Google is constantly crawling the web and they'll crawl things like Twitter and Facebook and stuff probably a lot more frequently than they're crawling your website. So having a link on Twitter with, you know, pointing to your website probably doesn't hurt. Um, but if you're using that as a way to prompt indexing and crawling and ranking, then yeah, I think you've probably got bigger fish to fry. Not only that, but also like posting regularly and consistently on your accounts on Twitter mm -hmm. and you're know, driving traffic that backlinks to, to your website. I mean, it's always good while you answer uh, a solution, you have a solution to a problem or to a question that your audience always think of your audience. That's, that's the main point really. Yeah, exactly. So uh, if you're producing content on a regular basis, then Google should be crawling your site more regularly. If like me, you kind of like blog once in a blue moon, then it's pointless Google checking your website every day. Why would they? Um, so, you know, it's fine if they're checking it as regularly as you're producing content, that's fine. Um, but yeah, like you said, I think it's, you know, if you're, if you're using social media for SEO, you're doing it wrong. You should be using social to build your brand and talk to your audience and yeah. promote your stuff. Don't, don't use it particularly with SEO in mind, use it to, drive traffic to your website and make more sales. Yeah, and have solutions for, you know, like problems that your audience are facing. Okay, so that was the last question, um, I believe. Uh, uh, any tips to outreach for content? Hmm. Um, so outreach is then kind of getting other people to talk about you. So building links, links are really oh. important in SEO. Um, so you want to get links. Um, quality more than quantity. So it used to be that Google would work in a kind of arms race way. So I would have 500 links, you'd have 501, you would rank higher than me. 
um, it doesn't work that way anymore. Google's got much better at understanding quality and context. So a link from the BBC is worth much more than a link from optimizing.com, sadly for me. Um, but also that kind of context, you know, so a link from a small site, but that is a real specialist in SEO. Google understands that that website is all about SEO and it's linking to you and you're all about SEO. Okay, they're probably building up and suggesting that you're in that kind of right field too. So quality and, um, con and context is much more important than quantity. Uh, in terms of uh, outreach and things, then uh, it's it's a that's a we could probably do a, a whole other webinar about how you reach out to people PR to get them to well, you know. Sorry, this, this is a PR. Um, yeah, and it's PR. Yeah, you know, it's PR and media. I know uh, SEM Rush uh, have um, sometimes includes links to websites that you can have back they suggest for you to have backlinks from it but the difficulty is much higher than actually again working on your own content on your own you know like uh, the, the the yeah basically the quality of your content and the trite answer to it is be link worthy so if your content's any good people would link to it yes you might sometimes need to nudge them and say hey you know we've just written this new guide about you know how to generate how hashtags on Instagram and it's way better than other ones you've used in the past and like prompting people and all that kind of stuff is fine but if you're just trying to say you know hey we've written yet another apple pie recipe will you link to my apple pie recipe no yeah. no one's going to do that it's like because your content's no good all right so thank you so much i think that was at the end of the question that was really interesting for me personally <laughs> um, and i hope it was helpful for the people who were watching us today uh so yeah i will take all the resources you want me to to post with this um with this video because it's going to be accessible for people to have a replay on our group so we will put uh, links to your website to your social media yeah, look, you can see it on here look yeah optimize <laughs> and any resources that you would like to share with us we will have it there and yeah anyone who has any questions uh after this video follow um follow andrew optimize on social media um and uh, yeah give him a shout out for today's because this was really really awesome and uh, thank you all for uh watching us today and thank you andrew